We are very excited today to announce MTIA. This is Meta's first in-house accelerator for AI. With MTIA, we own the entire system design from the silicon to the platform, to the software stack, to the application, and it allows us to customize for our unique recommendation workloads and really control our destiny in providing cutting edge AI for our users. So let's talk about why this is such an important and exciting step for us. At Meta, deep learning recommendation models, or DLRMs, are a key part of the company's business. They're at the heart of our family of applications, such as Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp. In this graph, we're looking at an important trend we have seen for models serving in production in the data center. There's significant growth over time in terms of model size, that is, the memory footprint, both in terms of the embeddings stored on the device, the yellow line, the model as a whole, blue line, and the complexity or the number of computations required per sample, and that's the pink line. So keeping up with this model growth in AI requires we deliver ML platform solutions that provide the expected ROI for our business. My name is Joel Coburn, and I work on AI hardware software co-design at Meta. This means I work on designing systems across the hardware software boundary to help deliver platform solutions that will address these model demands. So how do we do this? Traditionally, CPUs were used for serving inference models in production in the data center, but they're not a cost-effective solution to keep up with this growth. Hardware acceleration can address the power and performance issues. It provides a much more efficient way to serve inference requests, and it also provides the compute headroom to scale to future models. So take a look at this graph showing our server capacity increase over a two-year deployment period. You can see that the initial demand for increased capacity was met with the NMPI accelerator. So we're switching from the CPU in blue to NMPI in pink. But you can see the requirements for inference quickly outpaced the NMPI capabilities and Meta pivoted to GPUs because they provided greater compute power to meet the growing demand. But it turns out that while GPUs provide a lot of memory bandwidth and compute throughput, they were not designed with inference in mind. Their efficiency is low for real models despite significant software optimizations. And this makes them challenging and expensive to deploy in practice. So this is why we need MTIA. With our in-house accelerator design, we can directly address the requirements of DLRM workloads and adapt to model trends over time. So let me give a brief overview of our approach with MTIA and describe what makes it successful. So the goal of MTIA is to improve user experience in meta applications. That is, we want to provide more accurate and interesting predictions, increased watch time, higher click-through rates, all things that improve the user experience and are driven by better capabilities in AI. So we do this by providing better developer efficiency and better per-per-TCO over existing solutions. So developer efficiency. This means we can lower the effort to enable new models, write new kernels, and optimize performance so we can get models into production quickly and with high efficiency. And we do this by providing a development ecosystem built on popular and familiar libraries and infrastructure. So we integrate with PyTorch for building models, we innovate in the area of DSLs for kernel authoring, and we integrate with emerging technologies like Triton and MLIR. For efficiency, perp for TCO and time to production, we focus on doing a chip and system design with open source components and leveraging vendor partnerships. With this, we can take advantage of the RISC-V ecosystem, leveraging external IP and open source ISA and the LLVM compiler. All these things allow us to focus on the really critical part for our business, which is designing the custom ML acceleration logic that makes sparse and dense operations more efficient. We'll now go into more detail of the MTIA design. Amin will present the architecture, Roman will follow and discuss the software stack, and Olivia will describe the trends in the design and challenges to scale to future models. And now I'll welcome Amin to talk about the architecture. Thank you, Joel, for a great introduction and motivation. At this point of the presentation, I would like to review with you the architecture of the accelerator and the design of the systems that are used to deploy these accelerators in the data centers. But before we go and dive into that topic, let's briefly recap what the idea of the acceleration means. We run our workloads typically on the CPUs inside the servers, but the CPUs are not equipped enough to handle high demand workloads such as AI. Therefore, these workloads are typically offloaded and are run on adjacent systems that are coupled with the CPU and they are called accelerators. 
Accelerators either provide a lot more compute power or specialize on performing specific forms of compute such as processing graphics in the GPUs. Accelerators are typically tightly coupled with the CPUs in the servers and are controlled and managed by the CPUs. My name is Amin. I'm a research scientist in the infrastructure organization, and I have been active in the field of computer architecture for 15 years. With that brief overview, let's take a look at the first in-house silicon that Meta has built for its own workloads. In this photo, you can see the silicon die of the MTIA chip, which is fabricated in the 7 nanometer technology from TSMC. It runs at 800 megahertz, and it's about 370 millimeters square. It has a tight power budget of 25 watts, and within that tight power budget, provides 102 tops of integer eight accuracy computation, or 51.2 teraflops of FP16 accuracy computation. The accelerator uses both on-chip and off-chip memories, and can provide up to 800 gigabytes per second of on-chip memory bandwidth, or 176 gigabytes per second of off-chip DRAM bandwidth. Now that you have seen the die photo, let's take a look at the high-level accelerator architecture, as you can see in this slide. This slide shows the high-level architecture of the accelerator chip. As you can see, the accelerator is organized as an 8x8 grid of processing elements that are connected to each other via a mesh network. There are memory resources on the sides of the mesh that are connected to the PEs and can be used by them. These on-chip memory resources, which total of 128 megabytes, can either be used as addressable memory or they can be configured as a memory side cache, in which case they are supported by 16 LPDDR5 channels that provide connectivity to off-chip DRAM chips. There is a dedicated control subsystem and dedicated host interface unit that you can see on the bottom right that connects the accelerator to the CPU on the server. Now let's do a zoom in and dive into the internals of a PE. This diagram shows internal organization of a given PE. As you can see, the PE is equipped with two processor cores, which are based on RISC-V open instruction set architecture and are heavily customized to perform their tasks. One of the processor cores is also equipped with the RISC-V vector extension and can handle any form of general purpose vector compute. On the right-hand side of the diagram, you can see fixed function units that are specialized in performing dedicated forms of compute, such as matrix multiplication or calculation of nonlinear functions, or even specialized data movements within the PE or between the PE and the external memory. PE has 128 kilobytes of on-chip memory that can be used by the processor cores or the fixed function units. There is a central command processor connecting the processor cores to the fixed function units. It receives the stream of commands from the processors and distributes and orchestrates their execution on the fixed function units. On the left-hand side, you can see general purpose components such as timers or interrupt controllers or a very elaborate debug subsystem that are required for proper functionality of the PEs. Now, after reviewing the architecture of the accelerator, let's take a look at the design of the systems that are used to deploy these accelerators. In this slide, you can see a picture of the test board for the MTIA accelerator chip with the chip sitting right in the middle. It is using a dual M.2 form factor and has a power budget of 35 watts. It is connected to the host using eight links of PCIe Gen 4 for a total of 12.8 gigabytes of bandwidth to the host. The small form factor and power budget allows us to deploy multiple of these accelerator cards within a given system. In this slide, you can see the topology of the system that are used to deploy the accelerators in the data center. Up to 12 accelerator cards can be housed inside a single system. And they are connected to the host CPU and to each other using a hierarchy of PCIe switches. This particular topology allows the accelerators to talk to the host CPU as well as to each other in a peer-to-peer -peer manner, which does not involve the host CPU and does not interrupt the host CPU. The parameters of the system, which is based on the Yosemite V3 server specification from Open, Open Compute Project, are carefully chosen. The amount of host CPU processing power, amount of host DRAM, storage, network bandwidth, and acceleration compute power 
are all balanced such that they are optimal for our current and future workloads. When fully populated, the system consumes around 780 watts of power. But I should note that hardware is only half the story. For having a successful deployment, you also need a very powerful and flexible software stack that can map the resources of the hardware to the needs of the application. And with that, I would like to turn that over to Roman to talk about our software stack. Thank you, Amin, for the intro. I'm Roman Levenstein. I'm with Meta for over five years, and I'm leading the development of MTI software stack, which I'm going to talk about in my presentation. MTI software stack aims to provide a developer efficiency and high performance. It is fully integrated with PyTorch to provide a familiar developer experience. Using PyTorch with MTIA is as easy as using PyTorch with CPUs or GPUs. The MTIA software stack benefits a lot from flourishing PyTorch developers' ecosystem and tooling. On the slide, you can see that MTIA software stack consists of multiple logical layers. On the top, you can see the application layer, which represents, for example, a serving stack of a recommendation system. It is operating on top of PyTorch, and it's mostly hardware agnostic, supporting backend targets such as CPUs, GPUs, and MTIA. Below is PyTorch layer, which includes compilers and runtime. Let's talk about compilers first. Compilers are responsible for converting PyTorch models into efficiently executable MTIA code. First, we have the model compiler, which uses PyTorch FX intermediate representation for model-level graph transformations and optimizations. It's responsible for making sure that the work and compute and data is distributed among processing element grids and that the fixed function units accelerating the compute are always kept busy. It gradually converts the PyTorch graph into low-level representation, which is finally converted into LLVM intermediate representation. Next, we have the Knife domain-specific language. This is our own development, and it's responsible for auto-generation of efficient MTIA kernels from short, high-level descriptions of ML operators. The library of ML kernels is mostly developed using this domain-specific language, but some of the most performance-critical operators, like fully connected layers or embedded bags, are developed by human experts using low-level C++ and hardware APIs to make full use of available hardware resources. At the bottom of compiler stack, we have LLVM, which is based on open source LLVM compiler toolchain with MTIA extensions. It is responsible for the last level of optimizations, such as inlining, register allocation, and emission of RISC-V executable code for the device. Below that, we have PyTorch Runtime. PyTorch Runtime is responsible for multiple things. It provides such abstractions like MTIA tensors, memory allocation, and most of all, CUDA-like streaming APIs, which are needed for streaming and scheduling operators on the device. It's important to mention that PyTorch runtime for MTIA supports different modes of model execution, including eager mode and graph mode, which is a full model compilation to maximize performance on the device. It also supports running multiple models partitioned across multiple cards, providing the necessary synchronization and communication channels between them. Below PyTorch runtime is the host side device driver, which is responsible for communication between the host and MTIA devices. And finally, at the bottom, we have a firmware running on the MTIA device, which accepts commands from the host site runtime and driver and manages the execution of models on MTIA device. It's worth mentioning that MTIA software stack is still evolving and that we are working on making the compilers and runtime even more powerful by integrating them with the recently released PyTorch 2.0 which was presented by Peng in her presentation. We're also working on integrating MTA software stack with such new emerging technologies like Torch Dynama, Torch Inductor, and we are working on extending Triton domain-specific language to support MTIA ML accelerators. We are also looking into using 
MLIR, intermediate representation, for more advanced compiler optimizations. In the next slide, we are going to look at the performance and efficiency evaluation of MTIA. We evaluated MTIA against an NPI and GPUs using a set of DLRM models representative of what we run in production. They are shown in the following table. We see the low complexity model, medium complexity model, and high complexity model. The models vary widely in model size, up to 160 times, and in model complexity, up to 32 times. MTIA must perform well across this whole range of models. The pie chart on the right shows a typical breakdown of where the time is spent in a typical DLRM model. We can see that the majority of the time is actually spent on fully connected layers, followed by embedded back layers, and then trailed by such long tail operations like concat, transpose, quantize, and dequantize, and others. The breakdown gives us also insight into where and how MTIA is more efficient. MTIA can reach up to two times better perf per watt on fully connected layers compared to GPUs. Now, let's look at MTIA efficiency across the set of models. Just as a note, the MTIA software stack is still evolving. So it is a production software stack that must both adapt to the latest environment and changes like moving from PyTorch to PyTorch 2.0 but at the same time, it must operate well across a range of models to provide stability, accuracy, performance, as well as usability. We can see on the slide that MTIA achieves near perf per watt parity with GPUs and exceeds perf per watt of an NPI in all cases. Roofline modeling indicates that there is still much room for improvement. MTIA achieves impressive gains up to three times better perf per watt on low complexity models and trails behind GPUs on high complexity models, which is an area we have not yet focused on optimizing in the software stack, but we are looking into it in the upcoming halves. More details about these results can be found in our upcoming paper for the ISCA conference industry track later this year. With that, I would like to hand over to Olivia, who will tell us more about the next steps for MTIA. Thank you, Roman. Hi, I'm Olivia Wu. I'm the design lead for MTIA ASIC. Today, I'm going to talk about the next step for MTIA silicon development. Meta has been deploying off-the-shelf CPUs and GPUs in our data center. In this slide, we have a graph that shows the scaling trend of compute, memory, and network bandwidth on CPU and GPUs in the past 20 years. In this graph, compute is in orange, memory bandwidth in green, and interconnect bandwidth in blue. As you can observe here, that the compute's capability has been scaling at twice the pace of memory and interconnect bandwidth across multiple generations of CPU and GPUs. As we scale our system to support much larger and complex workload, this imbalance had manifested itself as bottleneck in our data center. You can see in the lower right graph here that some of our workload had spent as much as 58% of the time on networking and data transfer. By designing the AI silicon in-house, we are finally able to gain control over the full stack from application to software, system, and silicon. This enables us to finally close the gap and optimize the full stack for our workload and control our own destiny. MTIA is our first ML accelerator that we developed in-house, and we learned a lot throughout this process. As we develop our next generation of ML silicons, we will continue to optimize every aspect of our architecture to strive for a balance between computation capabilities, memory, bandwidth, and network bandwidth to achieve optimal performance for our workload. One of the key advantages of designing in-house silicon is the ability to co-design the architecture with our software team. As Roman had covered earlier, our software stack is fully integrated into our PyTorch ecosystem. With feedback from our co-design team, we're able to introduce new custom instructions and compute primitive for model innovation, create construct that will enable faster operator launch, memory allocation, and easy prototyping, and incorporate features that will allow us to future-proof the silicon design and scale with future workload. The advancement in AI is going to provide a tremendous opportunity for us to innovate 
and push the boundary of technology. Our in-house accelerator will allow us to optimize all the components of the silicon system and tooling to improve the cost efficiency of our infrastructure. It enables our software developers to create AI models that will provide more relevant contents recommendation and elevates the user experience to the next level.